Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you because of the importance and the centrality of faith in the life of the believer and the minister. We're praying at this time you lift up our faith. Help us to understand if we have faith, all things are possible. And for us as your ministers, your servants, your ambassadors, all things will be possible. In every home here, in every ministry, in every section of the work we represent, Lord, we pray that the success that have missed us in the past, now it is possible. And we know that you are going to accomplish great, great things through every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Anywhere we find ourselves will be more than conquerors. Because you are going to lead us to victory. We cancel failure from every life. Amen. We cancel oppression from any life. Amen. We cancel the fear of moving forward in every life here in Jesus' Amen. name. Anywhere. These servants of God here will succeed. Amen. You will prevail. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now we are talking about faith. And faith is not like every other subject. So I'm going to be preaching it not like every other subject. You know, when you preach all the other subjects, you'll stand here and then you'll stay like this. Because you have to be stable when you are preaching those subjects. But when you are talking about faith and you want to cross the Red Sea, then you are here. When you want to bring down the Jericho walls, you run over there because Jericho walls are not there. Then you come over here, you conquer your Jericho walls. And then you are moving by faith and walking by faith and living by faith and breathing by faith and laughing by faith and smiling by faith and conquering the devil by faith. We're going to talk about faith. And we're going to conquer in Jesus' name. I'm talking to you this time now on the essentials of faith. The essentials of faith. In Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Here it's giving us a definition of faith. A description of faith. An evidence of faith. Tell me, there is nobody on this earth that doesn't have a hope, a goal, a dream, an ambition, an aspiration. We're all common in that way. We hope for something. Even when you were a little child, before you became a Christian, you said, when I get older, I will be like that's what you are hoping for. And then when you became a Christian, then you said, I will be like, that's what you are hoping for. And then you began to read some biographies. And you were reading about this person and this person and this person. All of a sudden you said, I will be like, that's what you are hoping for. And then you were appointed to be a leader in the church and a minister in the gospel. And then you were saying, if I could be like, that's your hope. Why have we not achieved the things we were hoping for? Because of the lack of faith. After I said, I will be like, I hope to be like, I intend to be like the things we were hoping for. We didn't get them because faith was lacking. We began to have unbelief and discouragement. And we felt, yes, I thought I would be like. I was hoping I will be like the thing that is missing in your hope is what will come to give you. Because it says faith is the substance of the things hoped for. You hold it in your hand by faith before you hold it in your hand by sight. You walk by faith. You see it in your mind side. You see it in your possession before it actually gets to your hand. And then it is the evidence of things not seen. The evidence of things not seen. How many things do you see that other people do not see? How many things do you already realize it's there and the people could not see? 
Maybe it's in yourself. Let me give you an example. Maybe you had this before. Thomas Edison went to school. And the teacher could not see anything in that child. But the mother saw something in the child. It was not evident to the classmates. It was not evident to the teacher. But it was evident to the mother. What was it? You know, this Thomas Edison is the one that invented all these things. Electricity and the light and everything. And when Thomas Edison went to school, uh, the teacher said, this one is useless. You're wasting your time here. You cannot make it in life. Some people, they write your script for you. And when they write your script for you, they put it in your hand. Then you are reading that script and you are crying, I will never make it. He told me, I will never make it. Because you know, the teacher, that's the authority over the life of the little child in the primary school. And the authority told me, I can never make it. I can never succeed. It's a waste of my time staying in school. And so the child was crying and went back home. What have you come to do? The mother said. And so the child said, look at what the teacher wrote. The teacher said, I shouldn't be in school. That that's not my way that I don't have what it takes to succeed in education and they will not accept me back. They spoke to that teacher but the teacher refused and the teacher said but the child cannot make it. So the mother said all right he is my child is not your side. I see what you cannot see. That's the faith and then sat down with that child Thomas Edison and then brought up that child trained that child taught that child and now we don't even know the name of the teacher now. The man of unbelief is forgotten. And the man of faith will always be remembered. Put that down. The man of unbelief is forgotten. And the man of faith will always be remembered. Now, when you look at other people, your own workers, don't be like that teacher. You didn't see anything good in them. You look at your own child because of what you see now in the open, in the physical, in the natural. You don't see anything good in that child. Be careful lest you be like that teacher of unbelief that will never be remembered. And then the mother is the mother will remember now because it was that mother that had the evidence of things not seen. It wasn't there yet in the physical, in the natural, but the mother could see that. And that's what we're talking about, and this is so very important. In fact, we're told in verse 6, it says in verse 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. How many verses in the Bible do you have that says without this, it's impossible to please God. Not too many verses. That means that this faith is so special that whatever else you have, ability and strength and vigor and money and strategy and brain and method, without faith, you cannot please God. Whatever education you have, and whatever position or title you have, without faith, the bishop cannot please God. What God is looking for, what makes us successful in life? Is it my title as bishop? Is it his title as engineer? Is it his title as doctor? Is that what makes us to succeed in life? Even the unbelievers themselves. Unbelievers in quotes. Unbelievers in quotes. Because when we say unbelievers, you need to understand that unbelievers in relation to salvation. Some unbelievers in relation to salvation are believers in relation to technology. Do you get my point? Which of the believers, believers in relation to salvation, which of them, if there were no telephone, will wake up and say, I'm having a dream. I'm having hope. I'm having an inspiration within me that it is possible. Somebody far away in America should be able to talk to somebody here in Nigeria. And there had never been any telephone before. Many believers in salvation will become unbelievers in technology. They will say, impossible. If there is any invention, it's because of faith. If there is anything that people have raised up that was not there before, it's because of faith. 
That's why anything you are going to do, you are a believer in salvation, wonderful. Why don't you become a believer in ministry? A believer in invention. A believer in developing something. Because you see, as we go to the field and everywhere we go, when you are confronted with problems in your nation, anywhere you are, you say, these people idol worshippers. These people useless people. These people idolatrous people. These people Catholicism has blinded them. Has made them deaf. They will never come to the Lord. I'm waiting for the time when the leadership of this our church will take me away from this place because to stay in this place is a waste of time. He is a believer in salvation. He is born again. But he's an unbeliever in ministry. Did you get the point? When you are a believer in salvation, a believer in possibilities, and a believer in ministry, you know that if you only can believe God, all things in your life, in your ministry, and all things in your family, all things are possible. And without this faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is. It says, don't pray yet until you believe that he is. That where he was, when he created the world, that's where he still is. Where he was when he divided the Red Sea, that's where he still is. Where he was when he provided manna for 3 million people for 40 years, that's where he still is. Before you pray, don't just rush into prayer. There are many people that pray too soon. And they pray too quickly. And they are praying without knowing where God is, who God is, what God is, what God can do. Before you pray, know that God is. God is still there. What he did before, he can still do today. He that comes to God must believe that he is. And that he is a what? Rewarder. That word, reward. Now, very simple. Does it take something away from you or add something to you? Reward. It adds something to you. In your ministry, something will be added to you. In your ministration, you know, some people, they preach. And when they preach, after they finish their preaching, they are dejected. They are very, very sorrowful. They say, you know, I didn't do well. How do you know you didn't do well? They say that message was flat down. And then as we go out and you look at them, they can't smile. They can't do anything. You say, brother, what's the problem with you? You are my friend, I will tell you. I don't know the way the GS is thinking about me now. I put my foot in my mouth. What do you mean by that? That message, in fact, I don't know what happened to me. I used to preach better than that. The GS will think now that I'm a useless person because see the way I spoke. What do you mean by the way you spoke? Because the uh, message was a failure. How do you know? How do you judge messages that are failures? You know, I, I traveled. I just came back. And I had to deal with a very serious problem. The serious problem is this, that in that church, they were having such the scripture. And as they finished such the scripture, somebody asked a question. And the a leader answering the question, he was on the pulpit here, answering question, answering question. And the way he was answering the question, his sister there felt, hey, why is this man talking like this? Why is this man so ineffective? And the message is totally useless. Look at this. And her husband was in that, um, in that meeting. And so she felt that something should be done. Because look at the congregation. The congregation will get nothing as this man is answering the question. So she looked back. And as she looked back to the husband, wanting to beckon to the husband, that why don't you stand up and straighten out this thing? The husband was bowing down the head and was under conviction. And so she couldn't talk to the husband. And eventually when they came out, the wife said, when that man was doing that thing that was ineffective, I wanted to call you. And the man said, my wife, when we get home, I'll tell you something. 
when they got home and the man opened his mouth and said, I'm sorry to tell you, I've been a hypocrite. I've never been saved. You thought I was saved. When that man was answering the question, I became convicted. Now I want to surrender my life to Jesus. The man we thought was not effective. That Why is he talking like this? Why is his message not effective? Have faith in God. Have faith in your gift. God has given you the gift. Don't evaluate your gift with the way you feel. Because when you come to God, anything you do for God, God will add unto you. He will add success. He will add victory. He that comes to God must believe that God is. And that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, we're talking about the essentials of faith. Essentials of faith. Number one in our series. Number one is the definition of faith. Number two, the declaration of faith. Number three, the dynamics of faith. The definition, the declaration, and the dynamics. Number one, the definition of faith. Already you've seen it in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. You are hoping for something. As we are you know, going through the message, I want you to begin to think about what are the things you have been hoping for. Don't worry about whether you think it's too big or it's uh, way out there. That's impossible for me. GS can accomplish, but not me. Just begin to write down what are the things you have ever hoped for that crossed your mind. And then you dismissed and you said, no point. I shouldn't be thinking like that. That's overestimating my gift. That's overestimating what I can achieve. That is pride. Let's forget about that now. And begin to write down the things you have hoped for. Because it says faith is the substance of things hoped for. You've not seen them. Yes. But faith is the evidence of things not seen. So, you understand then, when you see it, before you see it, that's faith. Did you understand? When you see the stars of heaven, before you see a single child in the family, Abraham, that's the faith. When you see the sand at the seashore, and you know that your children will be as many as this sand at the seashore before you have even a single child, that's the faith. When you see the walls are still standing, and you then say, I know that these walls are coming down, and you see the walls come down already before they come down, that is faith. When you tell the children of Israel, be still. Hold your peace. These Egyptians you see today, you will see them no more forever before you even stretch your rod, before you even pray, before you call upon the Lord. That's the faith. You see it done before you see it in reality. That's the faith. The definition of faith. That's why it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 7. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. If you had a crusade, and you had planned for that crusade, and you had spent a lot of money on the publicity, and you have fasted and you have prayed, and there was faith in your heart that this crusade is going to give us a breakthrough, and then two, three days before that crusade, you began to have running stomach. And then the following day, running stomach. And the morning of the crusade, running stomach. And the crusade is coming in the evening. What are you going to do? For we we'll walk by faith and not by sight. My wife has been going to the toilet. What's the wife going to say? 
why don't you phone brother so and so because with this running stomach now what if you are on the stage and then the thing grips you <laughs> what are you going to do what's that walking by sight but when you say this crusade how did it come up god put it in our hearts when we told the church did we have a confirmation there was a confirmation they were happy and the people said this is the time and as the people contributed how did the money come the money has come in a way it had never come before because all the other programs we have been having will talk and talk and motivate and mobilize before money comes. But this one, the thing just flowed in. When we're going to have the place we're going to use, how did it happen? We just got there now and we said, we want to use this government apartment. And they said, ah, deeper like people, go ahead, where's your paper? And they signed it. It never happened like that. And now you're having running stomach. Doesn't all the other things that have been happening tell you that this is the will of God and that you are the one that will do this sin and nobody will take your place because your hand have laid the foundation and your hand will finish it and so when you are having that running stomach you say I have faith in God because I am walking by faith and not by sight and then, uh -uh, who is to control you? Are you the one to control this thing? Because whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Or is your stomach the one to control you? The running stomach is the one to control the outcome of the crusade? No. Are you not a champion? Go in this thy might, Gideon, and you will prevail. Because we are more than conquer through him that loved us he gave his life for us we're walking by faith not by sight now in john chapter 11 john chapter 11 verse 39 in john chapter 11 verse 39 it says jesus said take ye away the stone Jesus said, take ye away the stone. Now Jesus knew that Lazarus was dead. And yet he told them to take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh. For he has been dead four days. Jesus saith unto her, said not I unto thee, that if thou shouldest believe, thou shouldest see what? I want you to say with me, I will see the glory of God. Now, there is a secret to this now. The secret to this is, you will have to allow revelation knowledge to conquer sense knowledge. Just write it down. You need to allow revelation knowledge to conquer sense knowledge. Now, before Jesus came to this place, he knew what he was going to do. He told his own disciples already, Lazarus is asleep. But it's not the final sleep. It's a temporary sleep. Let's go there and wake him up. And the people said, but if he's asleep, he'll wake up by himself. And Jesus said, I'm not talking about that kind of sleep. Then they understood that Lazarus was dead. Already, the revelation was that we are going to wake up Lazarus. So, Jesus had revelation knowledge. But Martha had sense knowledge. What you see, what you hear, what you feel, what you taste, sense knowledge. And so, Jesus said, acting on revelation knowledge, because you know, every time you act, you are acting either on sense knowledge or you are acting on revelation knowledge. If you are acting on revelation knowledge, you are going to always walk on the water of life. You are going to always have your Red Sea divided. If you are walking by revelation knowledge, you are always going to have the victory. But if you are walking with sense knowledge, you are going to be like the natural men. Uh -uh. The people around us who don't read the Bible. The people around us who don't believe in holiness. The people around us who are still chewing their tobacco. On what knowledge do they act? On what they feel? On what they see? 
on what they think. What makes me different from the ordinary folks, the ordinary fellows? Because I get away from sense knowledge and I come to revelation knowledge. That's the only thing that makes me different. Because if I say I am a believer, I am a child of God, I am different from that man on the street. Wait a minute. How am I different from the man on the street? He's walking by what he sees and what he feels and what he can taste. He's walking by sense knowledge. And I'm walking by sense knowledge. How are we different? We have different names. We go to different churches, but we are virtually the same. And so Martha said, Lord, by this time he stinketh. Because he died four days ago. And then Jesus said, didn't I tell you? Let's suspend what we knew of history. What we knew of science. What we knew in our mind. What we knew by sense knowledge. And let's come to revelation knowledge. That is faith. When you walk by revelation knowledge and not by sense knowledge, that's the definition of faith. And then we're told in John chapter 20 verse 24. John 20 verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I see in his hands the print of the nails. I need to look at that before I can believe. Sense knowledge. And put my hands in the print of the nails. I need to touch. I need to feel. And thrust my hand into his side. I will not believe. Underline that word will. I will not. No matter what you teach me. I will not. No matter your own testimony. I will not. I will not believe. He made up his mind. Our mind is very important and very active in the area of exercising faith or not exercising faith. And you can train your mind like you train a child. You can train your mind like you train a child. That's very important. Many of us here, we have uh, children. Not only that, when you are a little child, uh, some of our children now, some of them, they don't have the kind of things we had when we were very young. When we were very young, if you were doing something wrong and your mother wanted to just make you change and not do that thing again, he might say, masquerade is coming, masquerade is coming. Did it happen anything like that? What do you say? Masquerade is coming, then you keep quiet. But eventually, that child, after you say, Masquerade is coming, Masquerade is coming, the child will, will be afraid. And then later, say, Masquerade is coming, Masquerade is coming. It's either the senior brother of the child will say, There's no Masquerade. <laughs> so, when you now want something, and mommy said, Masquerade is coming, Masquerade is coming. Let him come. <laughs> that child has been trained. That's the way you train your mind. Your mind, when you want to get something done, will put fear in you. You cannot do it. You cannot do it. And then the centurion whispers to you, I didn't know as much Bible as you know. When I told the Lord, speak the word only. If I, when I didn't know Bible, can't say that, you can say that. And this real Phoenician woman comes to you and she whispers to you and said, I was just a dog and I received great miracle. You are not a dog, you are a child of God, you can get it. And you begin to train your mind. You are training your mind. As you train your mind, then you said, although you said, I will not believe in the past. Now you say, I believe. Because Jesus said that before. I'll be given into the hands of the unbelievers. I will be killed. On the third day, I will rise again. Thomas, that the disciples have seen Jesus should not be anything surprising. If you go by revelation knowledge and not by sense knowledge. So come back to that again. Revelation knowledge. Then in the next verse, it says, and eight days after, came, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said peace be unto you then saith he to thomas 
reach hither thy finger and behold my hands and reach thy hand and thrust it in my side and be not faithless but believing and Thomas answered and said unto him my Lord and my God Jesus saith Thomas because thou hast seen me since knowledge thou hast believed blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed have not seen and yet I have believed now those things you wrote down that you are hoping for I told you to write. Did you write anything down? Do you know that those things are going to happen? Now, there's another consequence now. Because those things are going to happen, listen, listen, and you know they must happen. Tell me they must happen. Now, until those things happen, you cannot die. I'm not just saying, you know, I'm teaching something here now. Now, God decided this will happen. You agree with God. This will happen. What's faith? Simply saying what God has said. Simply affirming what God has said. Simply confessing what God has said. That's faith. So, God said this must happen. I agree with God. This must happen. Here am I now. The thing that will happen is in that place. I am here. While I'm here, I am sick. And then a thought comes to me. Ah, you're sick. You will die. I said, no. I can't die yet. Why can't I die yet? That thing there must still happen. Before I can die. Because God said it will happen. And I agree it will happen. And it has not happened yet. How can I die and make God a liar? Do you understand? This faith in our lives, it solves a lot of problems. And your mind becomes educated. And do you know, the moment you say, what's your mouth? No, I cannot die yet. We have a pact. We have an agreement. God and I. And there is something that is still to happen, which has not happened. And that thing must happen because we cannot make God a liar. Because of that, I cannot die now. You'll be surprised. Your mind then will respond, ah, it's true. You cannot die now. If you agree with the thought in your mind, ah, I'm dying. Your mind will keep on repeating, you are dying. You are dying. Once you know that, no, there's no way you can die now. Because there's still something to happen which has not happened. Your mind will agree with you. And once your mind agrees with you, that is the faith. And faith will never be disappointed. I go to point number two, and it's the declaration of faith. The declaration of faith. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm reading verse 13. We having the same spirit of faith. According as it is written. I believed. Therefore have I spoken. We also believe. And therefore speak. And therefore speak. And therefore speak. Have you noticed that when there is uh, something that is uh, happening, if those things are negative and you keep quiet, you shut your mouth, your mind will be very active and your mind will be talking to you. And then with what your mind is talking to you, your mind will be painting a picture, you will be seeing pictures that other people don't see. Do you understand? Now, uh, sometimes your wife has uh, gone out and as your wife has gone out, she should have come back at 1 o'clock, 1 p.m. And 1 o'clock, she has not come back. 1.30, she has not come back. And she has a um, handset with her. She should have called you. Whatever it is, she didn't call you. All of a sudden, something begins to talk to you. Am I talking to people? And uh, as this thing begins to talk to you, Imagination begins to paint pictures. These drivers in our land, they are too careless. <laughs> and, you know, these things that we read in newspapers, accident here, accident here, you know, you are building up. 
I hope that uh, this, uh, my dear wife, I hope that she has not gotten involved in an accident. Hmm. In an accident. Sometimes somebody does not even die, but the person becomes a vegetable and is paralyzed. Huh. If this woman has an accident and she is paralyzed, and there is nobody to take care, then I have to be sitting at home. I have to be doing the cooking and feeding her. How is she going to be taking bath? You see where you are coming from, and you would have gone very, very far because your mind is painting picture, and you keep quiet. And the problem is you are keeping quiet. When something is beginning to happen like that, you begin to speak out. I believed, therefore have I spoken. Speak out what you believe. We have a covenant together. That's my prayer partner. She cannot die. No evil can happen to her because of this promise. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me and follow her all the days of her life. And when you are talking like that, all the pictures that the devil wanted to sketch and wanted to paint, all those things are wiped away. So, don't keep quiet when thoughts are coming to your mind. You speak out. It says, I believe, therefore, have I spoken. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 27. Acts 27, reading verse 25. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. For I believe God that it shall be, even as it was told me. That's the declaration. I believe God. When you are talking to your workers, and those workers will bring information to you. And say, hey, Pastor, they've got another edict now. They've got another thing now that they signed. They said that in this country now, this is not possible. In fact, they said that they're even going to cancel the permission they gave us before to preach the gospel and to establish the church in this place. But what did God tell you before? Or were you walking in the church without hearing from God? Didn't God tell you something? For all these years, four years, five years, seven years, hasn't God spoken to you any time? Was there not a time you read the Bible, a particular promise, and then the Lord told you that was for you? Uh -huh. If it has happened, and you jotted it down, and you noted it down, then you say, I believe God. You tell your workers. You tell them, those people are not going to ruin the work of God. They don't have any power. To change what God has decided already. Because I believe God, it shall be even as it was told me. And as we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 18. It says, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are, tell me out loud. Well, we are preachers here. Since we started this ministry, there was a time, this is just for you, here in Lagos, that somebody was there on the seat of authority. And then he said, no evangelism in the bus, no evangelism here, no evangelism there. That's the thing we saw. The things which are seen are temporal. That man is gone. The things which are not seen, the kingdom of God is eternal. We are still here. Whatever happens, anytime, whatever you see, whatever they write, Whatever noise they make, whatever announcement they make, the things which are seen are temporal. Are we looking at that? What they say, what they write, what they announce. Did they write that for me? Because the things written concerning me shall be accomplished. And it's written in the word. The things written about us, they have an end. And because they have an end, that means we're looking at the one that is stable. 
are the one that Almighty God himself has for us. And therefore, we are not concerned and we are not bothered about the temporal, temporal things. And presidents come and presidents go. Governors come and governors go. Edicts come and edicts go. Ideas of men, they come and they go. But the things which are in the world... We know that this one, they are settled under the eternal pillars of the Almighty God. And no matter what, and no matter when, we know those are the things will be fulfilled. That's the reason why, as you are ministering and as you are working for the Lord, you don't look at things that are seen. You look at things that are not seen. And then you'll be able to declare, in fact, your language will give you out. Your language will make us know whether you're looking at things that are seen or you're looking at things that are not seen. Because, you know, when you look at those things that are seen, and then you begin to talk negative, I don't think this thing is possible here. In fact, it's not everybody that will be born again. It's not everybody that will be saved. It's not everybody that will know the Lord. And then you say, the church is growing at the headquarters. But you know, it's not every church that will be a big church. Why are you saying that? You are saying that because there is an edict or there is a particular plan, there is a problem in your area. And you think that because of the problem, your church cannot grow. And you want to justify the inability of the growth of the church in your area. That's why you are saying that. But now, if you are going to live by faith and walk by faith and speak by faith and minister by faith and do everything by faith, you look not at the things that are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Because the things which are seen are temporal. And the things which are not seen are what? That's the thing to depend upon. And that talks about the declaration of faith. I look at Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. In Numbers chapter 13, I'm looking at verse 30. Numbers 13 verse 30. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it for we are well able to overcome it. What if I'm in the minority? And this thing I'm saying, I'm the only one that believes it. What if all the other spies that went with me, all the other leaders that went with me, what if they're saying something different, something to the opposite? Listen to me. All the 12 spies were equal when they were sent out. You need to understand now. All the 12 spies were equal. Equal in authority. Equal in position. Equal in achievement. Equal to the Israelites. There wasn't, uh, you know, they didn't lift up Caleb or Joshua above the others. They were just the 12 leaders picked up out of the 12 tribes. What made Joshua and Caleb to be promoted above the rest of them. Their faith. What do you think is going to give you promotion? Because here now we are all equal. We are leaders in the church. What lifts me up above the rest of the people? What lifts you up above the rest of the people? Is your faith. Caleb stilled the people. While the others were saying, we cannot make it. We cannot do it. We cannot go into the land. And then Caleb chilled the people. He said, why are you saying what you are saying? Let us go up at once. For we, not just that we are able, we are how? Well able. I learned something from Caleb. I learned something from Caleb. That no matter what the people around me say, I don't have to say what they say. I don't have to feel what they feel. I don't have to confess what they confess. 
am I such a friend to somebody that I must give up my faith and get a some belief? Do I love somebody to the point that I love him to the point I'd rather give up my faith and swallow his unbelief? Not me. I'll be like Caleb. That no matter what all the others say, I still say we're well able to overcome. Therefore, let us go up at once. And eventually, he was able to go in. You will go in in Jesus' name. Number three now. The dynamics of faith. The dynamics of faith. If you've uh, studied maybe mathematics, there's something we call statics. And then the other side is dynamics. And statics is, you know, this table now that you place here. When you came the other time, did you find this table here? That's static. Always there. Will not grow. Will not expand. Will not shrink. Just there. And there are people like that. Just there. Just there. How are you, brother? Just there. As the work, just there. Any progress? Hmm. Well, we're not moving forward. We're not going back. Thank God we have not backslidden. Just there. <laughs> Do you want to be just there? No. But when you understand that there's the dynamics of faith and that you're moving out of where you were and you're moving to where you ought to be. And every day, every day, let there be the progress of faith every day in your life. That I'm able to accomplish something today I didn't accomplish yesterday. I'm able to realize something today I didn't realize yesterday. I am able to confess, achieve, accomplish something today that I didn't accomplish yesterday. You are dynamic and you are moving on you are not static you are not staying in just a place without any progress the dynamics of faith how does this thing happen let's see in first samuel chapter 17 for samuel chapter 17 and i'm reading from verse 48 for samuel 17 verse 48 here we find what David was saying and it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David that David was the next word he stayed and ran towards the army to meet the Philistine this is not just, you know, a faith that says, I will overcome you. I will defeat you. This day, I'll cut off your head from your body. And I will show the whole of the world. And the people of God will know that there's no God any other place except in Israel. Good talk. Put some action to your faith. And put some dynamite to your confession. And put some movement to your utterances. Do something, not just say it, move out. And we're told that when the Philistine came against David, he hasted and then he ran towards him. He didn't run away from him. What's the difference between the person that has faith and the person that does not have faith? Did you see the children of Israel before this time? In that same chapter, anytime that the Philistine came out, then the children of Israel ran away. But when the Philistine came out, then David ran, how? Towards the Philistine. How do you understand the difference between faith and unbelief? The, the people that have unbelief, they run away from their problems. The people that have faith, they run towards their problems. They said, this is a day of challenge. There is something to do here. This is wonderful. This is something I've been waiting for. And I'm going to show everybody that faith will always conquer. That's faith. The dynamics of faith. When you run towards your problem. 
And then we're told in Second Chronicles, chapter 20, Second Chronicles, chapter 20, verse 20. And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, and so shall ye prosper. Is that faith or unbelief? Faith. Look at what follows the next verse. In verse 21, And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord that should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and to say, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. You know the story, but the question I'm asking you is, if you really believed, why were you complaining after the confession of faith? Why didn't you sing? I know you know the passage, but if you really believed and you confessed that everything will be all right, why were you still sorrowful and moody after you said you believed? Why didn't you sing? Jehoshaphat said, I believe God. How do I show that I believe God? There is no Philistine to run towards. What am I going to do? I'm going to show the dynamics of my faith by appointing singers. And they began to sing. And while they were singing, all the enemies defeated themselves. Is it any surprise that the Christian church is a singing church? When did the church start singing? Don't you remember Paul and Silas? Here now, they were in the prison, and their legs were in the stalks. And they believed God. Because there have been many words of encouragement, assurance, accomplishment, that God had given to Paul the apostle. And he knew that this prison here is not the end of the road. I said your prison is not the end of the road. Your incarceration is not the end of the road. And even your discipline is not the end of the road. And the problem, the perplexity, is not the end of the road. If it is not the end of the road, why don't you sing? Now, listen, listen. After the singing, after the singing, Paul and Silas, if you follow the story very well, the following morning, they woke up, and the officers said, go and tell those men, they should go. Did you hear me? Go and tell those men that they should go. What did I come to do here? They didn't even bring us to the court. They didn't prosecute us. They didn't do anything. Why did we come here? Because of the Philippian jailer that needed to be saved. That's why they got there. Anywhere I go, any problem I have, any imprisonment that happens, there is something God wanted to accomplish. That's why. And when that thing is accomplished, those people there will say, let those men go. I release you. I said I release you. Stand up. And talk to the Lord. You have faith today. The declaration of faith. The declaration of faith. You are released. Let those men go. Let those women go. You are released. The Lord has released you. Released you into success. Released you into prosperity. And released you into accomplishment. You are released. We thank you because you have revealed your mind to us. Upon every brother here, every sister here, we pour your blessings. We pour your anointing. Amen. And we pray, Lord, everything you have spoken to the heart of everyone now, you confirm it in Jesus' Amen. name. 
We are praying, Lord, that from now on, your people will walk by faith. Amen. They will minister by faith. Amen. They will receive by faith. Amen. They will give out by faith. Amen. And we pray, Lord, the rewards that come to the people of faith will come to everyone here present today in Jesus' name. Amen. And we pray, Lord, the defeat of the past will be forgotten. Amen. The downfall of the past will be forgotten. Amen. The failure of the past will be forgotten. Amen. Now we're going to move on by faith. And great will be the success of your people in Jesus' name. Amen. And we confirm and affirm your work will prosper in our hands. In Jesus' name.